okay, we're now streaming, we're live, we're ready to go. Oh. Drew is talking, but we cannot hear him. But when he gives me a, this signal, how are we doing, Drew? Okay, I think, let's see. Are we ready, Drew? Thumbs up. Okay, all fantastic. Right. <laughs> fantastic. Well, we are so excited that all of you are here. And we had a very fun and engaging last session. And the only thing that we missed was having just like more people with us. And um, there is, we have a really fun text that we're going to be kind of playing with and wrestling with today. And um, the, the main thing that we are doing in this time together is that we are um, we're looking at narrative within our tradition, which as we know, so much of our tradition is narrative. It's what makes it so powerful and alive. And, um, you know, when we think about the Jews, we think of creation, we think of Adam and Eve, we think of Garden and Eden, we think of Cain and Abel, we think about all these dynamics and um, about all of these stories. And it is really what makes, um, what makes it accessible. And so there's two ways in our tradition that they talk about um, story and law. And the language for law in our tradition, as many of you know, is halacha, which is from the verb lichloch, to walk. And um, because the halacha is meant to be like the path. And I'm looking at Lois because we spent a lot of time talking about this, halacha. And um, that is like the details, do this, don't do that. And I would just say for myself, you need that type of framework to, to move in the world. We have a lot of laws in this country, thank goodness. Some people follow them, some people don't. Um, but the way that we understand laws and move into the kind of messiness of just being human is through story. You know, like sermons are not a list of laws. They're kind of, a, a, we weave together stories into some sort of fabric that people can wear and find some comfort or meaning or agitation out of. So um, I found this definition that I wanted to share with you. If I can, if I can do this, uh, let's see, it's always, you know, you never know going in what's gonna happen with a screen share, but I think this is happening. Um, okay, so this is from Abraham Joshua Heschel. And it says, Oh, so there's halacha, which is law, and then the, the story side of our tradition, which is embedded in all elements of our tradition, even in the Talmud, which we think of as very law-focused, is Agadah, which like the Haggadah, which is about story. And Agadah, um, and so we're going to look at this definition just to um, jump into the space of the tension or the interplay. I would say less tension, more interplay between halacha, the law, and Agadah, which is story and narrative. So this is the language of Abraham Joshua Heschel. And he says, halacha, the law, represents the strength to shape one's life according to a fixed pattern, right? And I'm actually looking at Pichi, who loves this element of the tradition about Shabbat and ritual and all of those things that help to give edges, to give us corners, to give us um, some sort of form and frame to work within. So it says, halakha represents the strength to shape one's life according to a fixed pattern. It is form giving force. Agada story is the expression of our ceaseless striving that often defies all limitations. Halakha gives us the norms for actions. Agada the vision of the ends of living. Why do we live? Halakha prescribes, Agada suggests Halakha decrees, Agada inspires. Halakha is definite and Agada is just like a little bit more elusive. And I think most of us feel like trying to make sense of life falls more in the kind of elusive space. Like we often are trying to define things. We like to have things in boxes, but life often falls outside of that. And the we know that, you know, our tradition, even the story of creation is not necessarily our story, that there's stories that came before us that had similar stories of creation, but we need these stories to feel alive. So I'm just gonna hit the pause there a 
Elizabeth, is there anything that you would add about halakha and Agadah and how you think about it? Well, and I, I mean, as you were saying that, I was thinking, well, I think, you know, story also gives a framework or gives edges in some ways because it helps us, I think in part why we tell stories um, and art does this as well, is that it also gives us a way to order something, a way to understand something, a way to maybe put some order to some chaos. And so I think um, there's something, there's like a really nice um, um, marriage maybe with Halakha and agada, in that they both, they both provide that, but just maybe in different ways. And, and story maybe gives us a little bit more um, and I was thinking about examples of what we're going to read today of like making me think, well, why, why did we, they why is this word? Why did they choose this word? Um, and what does that mean? Um, and, and so while it's, it's more suggestive, it also gives us a, it still gives us a framework by which to understand or make sense of something. Um, so I think they both, when I was reading what you were providing by Heschel, I was like, oh, well, I think they to me, they both they both provide that they both provide framework, but in a, in a maybe different ways, as it also was saying. <laughs> yeah, like I think you need both of them. Like they go hand in hand. Like if everything is just a soft story and there's no edges to it, then what do you do? And also, it's hard to make sense sometimes of laws, and so we have to be able to. I mean, that's the power of theater and the power of music and the power to take things that are very definite and make them abstract. And sometimes in their abstractness, then we can kind of relate to them. So um, we see this today, we're gonna look at a text from the Babylonian Talmud. So there's two Talmuds. There's the Jerusalem Talmud written in Jerusalem and that kind of more in Israel. And then the Babylonian Talmud, which was written in Babylon, which is now modern day Iraq. And it turns out over time, the Babylonian Talmud kind of crushes the Jerusalem Talmud and becomes the dominant Talmud of record. And so it's there's been in the last 100 years kind of a resurgence of the study of the Jerusalem Talmud. But when you look at halakha and Jewish law, almost all of it refers to Babylonian Talmud. And even there's some overlap and there's some differences. So we're going to look at one particular story of a rabbi who's thought to be from the first century, Honi. Honi um, Hamegel, who is Honi the circle maker. So we're just gonna call him Honi today, but his last name they think means circle maker, or he may have been a roofer. Often people are named from, you know, um, what was their work in the world, which I think this is also true for, for Jews often had a last name, a German last name. That was the activity that they did in the world. And um, he is a bit of a, he's a bit of a mystic and how he is represented in the Jerusalem Talmud and in the Babylonian Talmud is different. He's even referenced in the writings of Josephus, who is this amazing uh, Jewish general who wasn't much of a general, but was a great historian who was um, captured at Yodafat up north um, by Vespasian. I actually was at the dig where he was, um, this was during, I think in 67 common era as the Romans were take just, you know, in the process of destroying the second temple, they had surrounded this area in Yodafat we were like digging up ballista stones and coins from, from the first century. And he was well known and well regarded and was kind of enlisted to be a general, but was like horrible on the battlefield. And when Vespasian came, this Roman leader came and he circled, encircled um, Yodifat, slaughtered about 47,000 people. Josephus, wise fellow, hid in a cistern they pulled him up and he comes before Vespasian, this is his telling of the story, and says, I am a great historian and you will be the next Caesar and I will write your history. I will capture your history so that forever people will know it. And so his life is spared and Vespasian does become the next Caesar. And so the tales of Josephus, um, you know, they're not always thought to be completely accurate, but there's a lot of, of the details of history that are, are captured in there. So there's actually a detailed writing of the Battle of Yodafat that I was on the second year of the dig. Um, and he and so Honi, the circle maker, is also referenced in that writing. So there's kind of another affirmation of his existence. And um, so we're gonna look at one of the stories about him in the Babylonian Talmud, which was written um, between kind of the third and fifth century, roughly. Um, but it incorporates a lot of the stories of the Mishnah. The Mishnah is at the center. And of course, they're always 
referencing um, different texts from the Torah and the prophets and the writings. It's a lot, that was a lot of information, but it's just good to know. Don't you think it's like help Karen? It's good to know, right? It's good to know what we're talking about. Okay, any, any questions? You can always shoot a question in the chat box and then we can do our best to follow what's there. You can write it to everyone or just to Elizabeth or just to me. Um, great, so Elizabeth, what should I do now? Should I share the text and then you wanna read it? That sounds like a great plan. And as we go through this, as we are bantering and going back and forth, you can either put something in the chat box. If you feel super strongly about something, you can just unmute yourself and jump right in, right? Is that okay, Elizabeth? I think it's yeah, okay. Yeah, <laughs> jump right in. And if you're thinking like, if something's not clear to you, either in the story or what we're saying, that means it's probably not clear to other people. And so you are just doing awesome acts of goodness if you ask your question. So don't be hesitant. Okay, amazing. So I'm gonna share my screen and we'll read this first. Let's see if I can get to it. Everything, it's always a mystery. What will be, what will come up when you share a screen? You just never know. Okay. okay. And Ben, should I, I should read the whole thing, right? We'll, we'll go through the whole thing. And you tell we'll... me, you do it how you want to do it. And I'll just, yeah, I, I, I'll, I'll read the whole thing. Um, okay. That's, that's good. Okay. The Gemara relates another story about Honi Hameagel. Rabbi Yochanan said, all of the days of the life of that righteous man, Honi, he was distressed over the meaning of, of the verse, a song of ascents. When the Lord brought back those who returned to Zion, we were like those who dream. Psalms 126, verse 1. He said to himself, is there really a person who can sleep and dream for 70 years? How is it possible to compare the 70-year exile in Babylonia to a dream? So... Let, when we should just say, because we know Elizabeth knows something about Psalms, <laughs> that this is from the 126th Psalm, which we often think about, you know, um, you know, those, those who returned to Zion, that they, they were like dreamers, right? And this is actually the Yossi Klein Halevi book, like dreamers. Um, and so this is an example also of how the rabbis are playing with the text and they're moving between centuries as well. And so he's kind of like, in the Gemara, Gemara means the Talmud. So the Talmud relates another story. So this is just there. This is just the Talmud introducing a story from yesteryear. And then the story is talking about one of the verses from Psalms, this question about, you know, is there really a person who can sleep and dream for 70 years? Great, let's, well, let's read more and <laughs> we'll find out. <laughs> One day he was walking along the road when he saw a certain man planting a carob tree. Honi said to him, this tree, after how many years will it bear fruit? The man said to him, it will not produce fruit until 70 years have passed. Honi said to him, is it obvious to you that you will live 70 years that you expect to benefit from this tree? He said to him, that man himself found a world full of carob trees. Just as my ancestors planted for me, I too am planting for my descendants. Honi sat and ate bread. Sleep overcame him and he slept. A cliff formed around him and he disappeared from sight and slept for 70 years. When he awoke, he saw a certain man gathering carobs from that tree. Honi said to him, are you the one who planted this tree? The man said to him, I am his son's son. Honi said to him, I can learn from this that I have slept for 70 years. And indeed he saw that his donkey had sired several herds during those many years. Honi went home and said to the members of the household, is the son, is the son of Honi Hamayagel alive? They said to him, his son is no longer with us, but his son's son is alive. He said to them, I am Honi Hamayagel. They did not believe him. He went to the study hall where he heard the sages say about one scholar, his halachot are as, a, as enlightening and as clear as in the years of Honi Hameagel. For when Honi Hameagel would enter the study hall, he would resolve for the sages the difficulty they had. We don't know how it works. The volume thing doesn't come up. Honi said to them, I am he, but they did not believe him and did not pay him proper respect. Honi became very upset, prayed for mercy, and died. Rava said, this explains the folk saying that people say, either friendship or death, as one who has no friends is better off dead. 
So that's, that's the story. <laughs> so there, there's obviously a lot in there. Um, let's maybe just like jump. I just want to jump back to the first paragraph and just see if there's any, so we started, we kind of broke down this first paragraph about Psalms. And then we have this image of this man who is um, seeing someone planting a carob tree and is saying to him, like, what are you doing? What are you doing? What are you doing? Why are you planting that? Isn't it going to take 70 years? And the man said to him, the man himself found a world full of carob trees, just as my ancestors planted for me, I too am planting for my descendants. And so I think we wanted to open just like, what is that image that you have? Like, what, what is the message you think the rabbis are trying to communicate about why plant carob trees? I see Lois and Peachy. Um, I, I think the trees and the carobs are a metaphor for teaching and educating your children in the ways of Judaism. You're not connected. And um, that as he was taught, so he will make sure that his descendants are taught. I love that. Peachy? I once used that story, not the whole story, but I've never heard the end of that story, but the part about planting the carob tree, I once used as a proof text for a piece that I did that you are not required to finish the, the job, but it is up to you to, and I think that's the whole idea. I think that's, that is, or at least part of the idea that, that the, there's, there's something about thinking in, that Honey thought of in terms of familial kind of gifts that he wanted to leave. I understand that, but also um, there is the idea that, um, there are things we can start that we can't finish, but they're important to start. I love that. Why, why is it so hard for us to think this way? Why is it so hard to think about future generations that the rabbis have to write about it? Like, why is that such a struggle for us? Elizabeth, how do you, how do you think about that kind of resistance? I mean, it does seem like we're in this moment also where our country has become so good about caring about ourselves as individuals and struggle to hold the wider whole. Well, I, I was struck in this story about like Honey's disbelief in, in, in how long it takes. And that he, I think to me, what, what sort of stood out is that he, he, he's, he questions like, but you're not, you're not going to get to benefit. You're not going to get to see the literal fruits of your labor. So why do it? And, and uh, so, so I think there's the, the feeling of, right, we're making something for, for future generations, but also that it's, is there something difficult about starting the work as Peachy um, so definitely brought up, um, but not getting to, but a resistance to, well, I don't get to, do I not get to see it through? And, and uh, a resistance to not being able to see the fruits, literal fruits of our labor, figurative fruits of our labor. Yeah, this is very literal. Yeah, I see <laughs> um, Judy had her hand up and Adrian. Judy? There you go. <laughs> I think it's even very relevant today, very, very relevant today, because uh, we're talking about global warming and the greed and the hubris and the me generation that doesn't take into any consideration if I do X, then Y will happen further down. And we're seeing it all the time now in the period of global warming where you know, the wetlands weren't kept, so, oh, this happened. Or the fossil fuels, you know, were used to extinct, whatever. It's, it, you, everybody knows what I'm talking about, cut down the wood. There wasn't any concept that if you take it, 
you replant it. It wasn't any concept. It's all very greedy because basically it's what is it for me? How will I financially uh, benefit from this? And, and I think hopefully maybe in the next generation or two that will reverse and say, wait, what is good for the land will be good for our future generations. Thank you. Yeah, I love that. And also, you know, there is, it's interesting why it's 70 years, because there is also this sense in other Midrash talking about that there's 70 faces of Torah that we're always trying to turn it and understand. And so there does feel like a little bit of like, there is also, you know, this sense that dreams are um, one sixtieth of prophecy. So there's something about this he he is he he eats his bread. He drinks. He he lies down. He wakes. He is he sleeping? Is this real? Is it is it you know? He's trying to interpret what's happening. And sometimes we just need other other ways of accessing kind of like d the divine and what can be in the future. Like we all really we I think we want to see the future, um, but it's a struggle. It's a struggle. Yeah, Adrian, you just have to unmute. Okay, have I unmuted? Yeah, I think there's something delicious in this story in that it's mind bending about time. And I come from a, a culture where one of the things we're shown all the time when we're taken to these big country houses or things like that as a child about the alleyways of gorgeous trees that were planted 300 years ago. Mm. So, they would say, so it's our fault. But I mean, it is a wonderful idea that uh, it's something happens now and then it happens in the future and it happened in the past. So I love this story. I think it's like all those um, kind of science fiction books you read. Yeah, and there, there's a lot of that, right? Elizabeth, yeah, I mean, we yes, see that. Like that. Yeah. There's, there's so much strangeness too um, in, the, in the later parts. Um, uh, can I jump ahead to, to one of the, yeah. the parts that I thought? Um, I, was, I was really curious about um, what it meant that a cliff formed around him. And what did that mean? Um, like li li literally maybe, but also in the sense of time, but also I wonder what else, what else what else could it mean that a cliff formed around him hmm i love that as just um you almost think of it as um you know um like over the course of our of our life just like we are there's a lot that's formed around us and we have all our stories and narratives that help us make sense of things but also it's like when you do, just going back to this archeological dig that I was on from 2000 years before about this Romans versus the Jews battling at Yodafat with Vespasian and Josephus and that, you know, there's this sediment that builds up. Mm -hmm. And there is a way I think all of us have sediment that builds up on our ability to think differently. Like we kind of know what we know and it can be hard. Choni's really struggling here. Um, so we don't know if he's seven, maybe, he, I mean, this is interesting. I wonder, is he 70 years old when he has this experience? I mean, he's a, this wise person. He's, he gets the name circle maker because he's, he's kind of an iconoclast. He, um, he is, um, there's no, there's no rain in the winter. And so he makes a circle, stands in the middle of a circle and screams at God and says, I'm not leaving this circle until you give us rain. We're dying down here. And that's how he becomes Honey the circle maker. And first it starts just like drizzling and Honey's like, that's not enough. Um, and kind of uh, demands that there be a downpour, but then it's too much, of course, that the Jews is too much. And so then he says he needs it a little softer. Anyways, God gets it just right eventually. But this is the type of person Honey is. And so I don't know, it's such a great question. I don't know what other people think about this idea of cliffs that form around us. Um, very, it's very, it's very visual, isn't it? I wondered if, you know, moving ahead to, to the story, you know, he, it's, he comes out of it and it's so disorienting, obviously. And, and he's, you know, obviously there's been like time travel or, or, you know, I'm not even sure if that's the right term <laughs> exactly, but, um, 
so this feeling, I mean, like bef- before before that happens, he he seems to not be able to understand or he questions the value of planting this tree, you know, for future generations. And so does the cliff represent some some sort of level on which Coney can't can't see past a certain point that it's it literally builds a wall in front of him that he can't he can't see he can't see he's I mean if he's a circle maker he's he's literally built just a close circle around himself that he can't look in he look can't look past a certain point and does the cliff represent something about that I wonder hmm. I see Adrian has her hand up uh, um I, I feel like that about computers I feel I, I built a wall around myself. I can, I can understand what I can understand. I can't understand anything more. Like I'm, mm-hmm. I'm stuck in the way I was raised. On the yeah. other side, like some people identify as not being able to cook. And so they're like, I'm not going to practice it because it's like the thing I don't know and I don't do, so I'm not going to work on it or finances. Or, so, I mean, some people, I mean, it's more common in New York City. You often bump into people who never drive. They're like, that's not a thing I do. I don't drive. I mean, in LA, you have to drive to survive. But like in New York, there's a lot of people that never drive. They're just like, I'm not going to look on the other side of that cliff. Um, Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, Judy. Uh, 70, I think, is is just a long, you know, long time. They use 70 a lot as being a, a long, long time. And I think that what he's really saying is you're not going to be able to see the fruit of your labor, but you have faith that in the future, it will be, it will be uh, positive for the next generation because you're not building it for yourself, but for generations down. And the cliff is very, you know, nobody can see beyond the cliff. We can't see the future. Nobody saw the pandemic coming. We can't see the future for our children, that more for our children, for children's children, for the for all the generations that are coming. And I think that's a good imagery uh, to use a cliff to say, you know, it isn't open to you. It isn't, mm. it isn't a- available to you. You mm. just have to have trust or faith. Thank you. Um, Elizabeth, I was wondering, I was going to do screen share that last section, if you would want to read that. And you had some other great questions in there as well. Let me share that. This, uh, what you're sharing here. Yeah, this (laughs) this is the final piece. And I think it's interesting, you know, this is really true, just to go back to what Peachy said, is like Peachy has seen this text before, but she may not have seen the ending of it. It's like many people know the story of Purim, where Esther and Mordechai are like, kick in Tuchus, but then you don't know at the end that the Jews slaughter all these Persians, because that's not like our favorite part of the story. And there, this, this, this complicates things. This ending complicates things. It's a really nice, clean story when you look at just the first part about, um, you know, questioning the 70 years, why do you have a carob tree, go to sleep, wake up, okay, now I see, blah, blah, blah. But then this, this feels actually a little, like I feel a little pain in this. When I read, it feels hard on my heart when I read this last section, but it actually feels real for this moment also, particularly. Yes, I will read this part. Um, Honi went home and said to the members of the household, is the son of Honi Hamagel alive? They said to him, his son is no longer with us, but his son's son is alive. He said to them, I am Honi Hamagel. They did not believe him. He went to the study hall where he heard the sages say about one scholar, his halachot are as enlightening and as clear as in the years of Choni HaMe'agel. For when Choni HaMe'agel would enter the study hall, he would resolve for the sages any difficulty they had. Choni said to them, I am he, but they did not believe him and did not pay him proper respect. Choni became very upset, prayed for mercy and died. Rava said, this explains the folk saying that people say either friendship or death as one who has no friends is better off dead. Um, this this whole part, there's so much to 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 tackle. I I one thing that I really struck me in the be, in the beginning is um, uh, why 
um, well, one, why in the story do they, um, is, is Honey not believed? Does, like they say a number of times they did not believe him. Um, and I mean, I think there's like the obvious literal reason of this seems fantastical that he would come back after 70 years and, and uh, you know, his, his descendants maybe didn't survive, but he is still here. So I, so there's that I understand, but, but it's mentioned, I think more than once that they did not believe him. Um, and, and I just wonder what's the significance of that? I really, I mean, I just have that feeling you know, I mean, it's the people who knew him aren't there. Mm -hmm. And so they know, they do know him, right? They actually, and it's interesting, the texts affirm that he is a known sage and scholar and thinker. And, you know, I think a lot about this just, you know, I just ha had a ship, led a Shiva um, Monday night and the stories were so powerful, so palpable, so, so alive, like people, you know, but so people know know of him but they of course this is the time where there aren't photos and things like that so he can't just show, ask him to go grab a photo but you know he's not seen and so he's kind of there's a resonance or kind of a rippling out from the impact of his life but he's not he's like invisible mm -hmm. at the same time yeah i see judy Of course, nobody knows him because he's he has no friends there because he's living in the future. He's waking up in the future. So, so is it good to be able to live in the future? And I think the, the outcome is if you have no friends, you have no family, which is obviously what happens generation, generation, generations down, then you're better off just being dead or it's like you're being dead and of course they didn't know who he was because they only knew a name but they had no idea of, of the person I love it because Judy's connection is a little bit it's a little unstable Judy but I have this feeling that you are like speaking to us from the future like you could be from another you know what I mean like you're it's like your voice is coming in and then it it looks like you're muted, but your voice still carries. It's like you're operating on a different mystical plane than us is maybe also what's happening. Peachy, were you gonna say something? Well, I, I was just gonna say, I think that the, the um, this is not to answer Elizabeth's question because I think that's a puzzlement. I mean, the fact that they don't believe him, um, I don't, uh, is understandable because it seems impossible. Um, but I don't understand the friendship part of it. I mean, one does not have to be a friend to recognize wisdom or values or whatever we want to talk about. Um, and I thought that, that that sounds like something that somebody was sitting in the room and said, oh, he just wasn't a friend. So that's why I didn't believe him. But that doesn't sound plausible to me. I, I don't really understand that. But it's written so they thought that there was some value in it. I see Karen. I agree with Peachy um, and, and Benjamin. It was sort of heavy on my heart also, that last part. However, the bit about friendship didn't seem to fit to me. Um, he could have died for a lot of reasons, including he was 70 years older and that was just a physical thing that happened, but that that ending about friendship didn't, it just, it, it was like something that had been written elsewhere and somebody just threw it into this part. It, in a way, it didn't ruin the story for me, but it, it, it just wasn't appropriate for that story. And it is logical why people didn't 
know who he was, didn't know him. And perhaps because of what he learned about the carob tree and all of that, they didn't know him because they hadn't heard that story, that part of him. They hadn't heard his wisdom or his Torah about that. So they didn't know him on the personal level, but also on the, the intellectual level. They, they didn't know him. Yeah, and I mean, how common is this? I would say for me, when I'm working with people, um, you know, who have lived a long time, they often are feeling like a lot of their loved ones and friends have passed. And when they move through the world, they're seen oh. themselves as someone who is, you know, in their, in their 40s or 50s or whatever that number is for them. But they see that they're seen as someone who's much older. And often that makes them invisible. They have a sense of being invisible. This is a thing that our society is exceptionally good at. It's a horrible quality. And you could see that it's not only that they didn't believe him, but they didn't give him kavod. They didn't give him this respect, this honor of his of the fullness of his life. He's really he's really made invisible, and he's had this kind of ex extraordinary experience of time travel. But and he's kind of had a question answered. He has a question about why plant the carob tree. But then when he arrives in this place, he sees that even while he has an intellectual answer. He kind of has a he kind of has a this absence of the soul of 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 feeling this emptiness of what not being seen of not being respected and he becomes so upset and what does he do he prays for mercy for compassion and and he dies he's basically asking like this is this is i've had enough like i got my intellectual question answered but more than that that's not what i'm upset about i'm upset i'm upset I'm, I'm upset that I'm not, I don't have people around me who know me. That feeling of being known is it's so powerful, it's so potent. And it's, I mean, I haven't really thought about this before, but just like, what is the thing that we're really seeking as we move through the world? You know, what is the thing that gives us value? And so, of course, the rabbis, they, they feel a very powerful weight of, of a chaver, a chaver is a friend. So chavruta, that one-to-one -one study, at the root of that is chaver, it's friend. And chaverim in like Israel, your chaverim are like your people. They're the people that are like on the journey of life with you. You know, they're with you in the hard moments and the sweet moments. And when you feel like you don't have a chaver, like that's like, that's, that's the sense of exile in a way, the sense of, being removed from divine, you know, and we know, we all know that feeling of losing a dear friend of how hard that is or a beloved. Um, but if that is, if it's not just one person, but if it's everyone, you appear in a world where you, you don't know people and you're not known, um, how, how painful that could be. In a way, you, I see what Karen's saying. It could look like this was like tacked on in the end, but it's also just like, what does the future look like if you don't, if you don't know people there and they don't know you, it's kind of makes it so real to me. It's not just this fantastical excursion. It's actually like a real, um, it really speaks to what is the human, ex what would be the human experience of that moment of, of being in the future. Because he is, they, they do mention his name, but they don't recognize him. So the sages or, or the, the, um, uh, the, the scholars are talking about like, oh, this is, is like the days from, from Honi Hamagel, but they don't recognize him. And so to me, there's something about in the beginning, he's talking about, or he's questioning about descendants and, and the legacy. Um, and so he has, he has some kind of, there is some kind of legacy that he has, but at the same time, he's not known or recognized. And so I'm wondering if there's, a connection, you know, where that I, because I agree the ending about friendship feels very out of place from the rest of it. Is there also some kind of connection of, you know, what, what is the quality? What, what, what is the, people might know something about us, but, but also we, we wish to be known. 
um, it's not only what we what we leave for the future, but also we we wish to be known. I mean, I think there's something also really interesting of like he's slept for 70 years and he missed he missed some, you know, he he missed getting to see some of the things from his from his life. Um, and so I wonder if there's some sort of connection of, or, or, or lesson about, it's not only, it's not only about leaving something for the future, but it's also about the relationships of, of now as well. Yeah, I guess they could have ended it a different way. Like it could have been like, he felt awesome that he was referenced multiple times as right. being this great sage and great scholar. And I think this is something, of course, like all of us feel this weight of like, does my life matter? Do I have impact on future generations? And there's actually this other kind of fantastical time travel story that people may know about Moses, who has this encounter with God, kind of saying like, what is the, Come what? In. What is, what is this, what is this story? Like, what, what is my story? What's my impact in the world? And God kind of grabs Moses and transports Moses up a couple thousand years into a classroom. And he's in the back, Moses is in the back of the classroom. And um, there's a rabbi in the front teaching about the kind of legacy of Moses, Moses's words and deeds and how they, we carry Moses's traditions forward. And Moses says, who is this person? Um, who is this brilliant person who's talking about me? And God says, that's Rabbi Akiva. And, so, and Moses is like, wow, what amazing, he's an amazing teacher. He's so dynamic. And what happens to him? And God is like, he dies on a stake because Rabbi Akiva is killed on a stake by the Romans in the Bar, Kuch Bar Kuchba rebellion. And so again, we're at this like kind of amazing, fantastical story, but then there is like this kind of like harsh, truth that is also part of it which I in a way I mean I find comfort in it because I feel like we are the people of the kind of harsh truth <laughs> like we have a lot of beauty but like life is like has a lot of harsh truths as well that we have to wrestle with and you know it's not it's it's not all roses you know like when we do the check-in with the confirmation kids we often start with they either call it happies and crappies or they call it, you know, roses and thorns. What are the roses and thorns? And that's kind of an amazing, I never really thought about it, but what a powerful way, even with teens to be real. Like, don't just come in and say what's great. You can also share what you're struggling with. Um, so I think that is really present, present in the text as well. Did you have anything else, Elizabeth, or did you wanna just open to see if other people had other reflections? I'd, I'd love to hear other people's reflections. Is there anything else in this text that's just kind of like sitting on your heart or something you're thinking about? Anyone? I'm just wondering if there's some people who haven't spoken yet, and then we can kind of go back. You know who you are. I'm looking at you. We want to hear from you. If you want to share, optional, optional. Okay. okay. Oh, there's Marilyn Ross. Um. Well, you know, I was thinking about people, older people that move from where they've been to a community where nobody knows them or moving to a nursing home and nobody knows who they were before and, and how hard that is for the person because they're, they know who they were and, but they don't have the support of you know, friends or family sometimes to be around them and how disconcerting that can be. Yeah, it's hard to locate yourself when you don't, when people don't know you. I mean, it's the thing about being with old friends that have seen the kind of arc of your own journey that's so powerful. Absolutely. And how just, I mean, what a great reminder that is of, of how, we all want to be seen <laughs> and, and, and we all want to be remembered, seen and remembered. Um, and, and I think this, this time that we're in, you know, has, has been such a profound reminder of that, you know, just we're all, you know, in many ways being very siloed right now for a number of reasons and, and how, you know, when somebody, you know, just out of the blue sends you a text or you remember, you know, something, especially now, you know, that, that 
feels to me anyway, even more meaningful than it did even before. Um, because, you know, we're, uh, we aren't, we aren't providing as many mirrors for one another as we were <laughs> in this time. And so to, to, you know, we're putting in that extra reminder of like, I'm, I'm seeing you, even if you don't see me all the time seeing you, I'm seeing you <laughs> and how meaningful that, that, that can be. I love that. I saw Judy had her hand up as well. I, I just see this story as the natural progression of how human beings ha happen to, uh, your life cycle and, and as a life cycle you, you you can't have people living longer and longer you're remembered in the minds of people which might not be actually you know it's it's, it's the stories told are 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 probably embellished or something so I think it's, it's, it's coming to grips with the life cycle, like the, you get Alzheimer's or you go into a assisted living and nobody knows you and nobody, and, and I think, I think it's, it's an understanding of, uh, this is a natural cycle of life. And, and, uh, and he's talking about that, I think. Absolutely. Yeah, I love that as a natural cycle of life. And then I just wanted to, as we move towards wrapping up, um, uh, you know, Mark, um, put a note that you can see the three generations of Honi. Of, it's Honi and then, you know, his kid and then grandkids and then Honi reappears. And that in the Native American tradition, this idea of seven generations, that as you're making decisions about what's happening today, you should be thinking seven generations out. And it feels like, at least for me, I would say like on my hopeful days, I am like this separation and suffering over the last year, I hope that it is like an awakening that we stop thinking about like the next three months or six months or whatever it is or whatever the political cycle is and that we could start thinking about longer term seven generations out because I mean, it, you don't have to be a genius, stable or unstable to see that just like the implications of our climate and what's happening in Texas and California and all over the world is happening. like we can't really be having a conversation about the state of our world, it's happening. So I'm, I, I do hope that there is some sort of global awakening and that we start just, you know, uh, not needing to have these kind of visions like Honi that we can, this has been a little bit of a Honi experience. I mean, it's been a little surreal. I mean, a lot of surreal, you know? Um, I mean, I think it's hard to imagine. It's already been a year that we've been in this state of living and trying to make sense of it. Um, so I want to hand it over. I see Joy, you have your hand up. Why don't you share Joy? And then I'll give Elizabeth the last word to wrap it up. You just have to unmute Joy. It used to be we could unmute, but then Zoom changed that. Can't hear you, but we want to. I just did. Okay. You Thank you. Great. Hi, everybody. I don't know why, but when we're talking like this and it's so meaningful, can you hear me now? And so understanding. The 23rd Psalm. Oh, just a minute. My iPad is repeating me. Excuse me. Joy has a streaming in multiple locations. <laughs> I love it. She's not a one. But I don't know how to use. My thought was the 23rd Psalm which you might think is out of the envelope for what we're talking about. However, when I think of the one sentence, thou art with you. Is it walking through the valley of death? But thou art, okay. So this is a prayer of uh, kindness and that you're with God and, and feel good about it, I, I, I think. But what I'm trying to say is, this time traveler, if he was a man of faith, I think none of us brought up his faith in G-O-D or the Lord. He didn't seem to feel, uh, I agree, 
know, family, no friends, forget it. You think you're on Mars. But do you know what I'm saying? This, this person, uh, wh what would you say to that about where does faith come in with this person? That's... I mean, I think there's something as um, I'm, I'm forgetting who said it, but there is this wonderful thing of that he does, you know, he questions the, the, the value of the carob tree, you know, at, or planting a carob tree that you won't get to see the fruits of. And then he gets to come back and learn that there were, that he had these descendants and, um, and that, you know, the, the fruits of those labors, you know, will, will continue. And so there's something um, you know, maybe about the fact that there is this continuation, um, that he is actually very, it's, he's privileged to get to witness, even though it might not feel satisfying, um, to him at that time, um, that it does go on. Uh, and there's something meaningful there and reminds me of, you know, uh, something, eternal continuing and and is God in that and maybe that's the perfect thing which is like you know belief isn't like a super high order for the Jews it's like about practice and there's the pra the practice you could the practice could be lighting Shabbos candles it could be keeping kosher it could be you know having a Passover Seder it could be planting trees right these all of these actions all of the rituals all of the halachot all of the laws are the practices. What meaning do they give? We need story to give us the meaning. In a way, that is this, this is the story of Halakha and Agadah kind of swinging back and forth. Like, is the ritual of planting something? Like when we celebrate Shabbat and we model that for our kids, like they're gonna be more inclined to be having that celebration. If we never do it, then like, why would we think that they would do it? Like, they're not gonna have that, that formation of the carob tree. Um, so that's really helpful joy for helping it bring it all around. We probably should have done that anyways, but we didn't, but here we are doing it. Thanks to joy. Um, and maybe that was divine intervention. <laughs> it could be anyways, that is going to conclude our time. Elizabeth, thank you so much. This is so fun to partner with you. Can we just put our hands in the air for Elizabeth? <laughs> Woo! And thank you all of you put your hands in, in the air for yourself. Yay. Yeah. And Drew, Drew is our superhero who came in and got it so that I wasn't in one room and you all were in here and he got, he opened it up and made this all happen. So thank God for Drew. God. Literally. <laughs> and I hope you all have a great day. Great to see you. Thanks for joining us. <laughs>